right. Well, welcome to everyone coming in. Uh, we're very excited to launch our first developer series regarding Aragon's new protocol, new product, a bunch of new fun things coming out. Um, and here with us, we have Carlos Juarez, who is our VP of engineering, VP of product development, um, the guru of everything regarding Aragon's new product. Um, and we'll have him join us to speak more about like the tech, the geekiness, um, all the real uh, infrastructure of what we're building, the trade-offs and, and the decision-making. Um, so hello, Carlos, where are you calling hey, hey, us hey. in from? I'm calling from Valencia, Spain. Oh, nice. Is that where you're from? Uh, yeah, I was born here, uh, but not right now I'm based in Lisbon. It's just like I'm visiting my parents. Ah, oh, okay, nice. Uh, well, I, well, well, we'll get right into it. Uh, I think the biggest question to kind of start off uh, this conversation is finding out what first brought you here. Uh, what brought you to Aragon? Where are you coming in from? I would love to hear a bit more about your background. Yeah, so actually, like most people at the comp at the organization know me from a couple months ago because that's when i joined but actually the first interaction that i had with with aragon it was in 2017 i believe it was in the aragon so like that conference that aragon did back then where i was a volunteer so uh it, it was actually pretty fun because like when i joined it was like oh i'm going to meet so many people that i actually know already from the aragon i was like what where's the where the hell is everybody um but yeah, I started doing things regarding Aragon back then in, with the Aragon. And even before that, I think the thing that inspired me the most, like everyone in crypto would say, was the video that Aldri made called Fight for Freedom. It just, it's just so good and inspired me the most to get into crypto in general, not just to Aragon. And then in the Aragon, I launched also my protocol the very same day that the Aragon happened. So it's also like oh, Aragon has always been a, a really important thing for me in crypto. It has always been there in part of my history. So I'm really glad that finally I'm here helping the organization create all these new protocols. Oh, love to hear that story. It's beautiful. Um, and to give uh, everyone else some context, uh, even within this journey, you said you launched your own protocol. Are you an engineer? What kind of uh, development do you usually do? Yeah, sure. I'm, I've always been an engineer. Uh, still am, I would say. Nowadays, I don't do that much coding right now in Aragon. So all the kudos, all the good work has been done by others. I'm just here helping a little bit where I can. But yeah, I'm definitely an engineer. In my previous company, Gesser, I was a CTO. And then when we get, got acquired by Gemini, I was also an engineer there helping with staking products. All right, nice. So you have a, quite a breadth of engineering experience. So I guess we can dive right into it. Like, how do you even code a DAO framework? I think that's a question that um, anyone within this space may have, which is uh, we're building this DAO framework that encompasses in many ways a lot of uh, people layer, treasury layer, community layer. What, what does it mean to code this into uh, a protocol and into smart contracts? It's actually very easy. You just need passionate engineers, the best designers in the industry, Security mindset, uh, you, you have it done. Like, you just need those things. Uh, you have that, easy. No, really. Um, so there are, <laughs> like, what the important people here do, all these people, it's basically you first need a protocol in the terms of smart contracts that enables to have enough flexibility to grow with the, with the DAOs that want to participate in, in the sense like, Anything can be a DAO, really. But if you want that DAO to function, it needs the proper procedures, it needs the proper connections, it needs the proper permission management. And that's what we do here. So if you want to code your own DAO framework, first you need to have that vision of all the pieces that need to be connected and then start one by one. I would say the very first one is having a vault, which is where the DAO is going to host like their NFTs or the ERC20s or whatever they have. And that contract, it's probably going to be super simple or normally, in general, you know, the DAO framework is actually somewhat simple. It just executes things. And what it executes, that normally comes from another contract. And in our case, it comes from plugins. We will go into them afterwards, I believe. But yeah, you, you need that first protocol that, that starts with a vault. 
then you add plugins or any other logic on top of it to decide how to govern the DAO or who can execute things. And once you have that protocol, that core protocol in written in Solidity or the language that of your choice, then you will need the app frameworks or like the web that interact with it. That can come in many colors, shapes, and objectives. And that's the cool half of starting with a very lean protocol, uh, as I mentioned, because it allows you to go into many topics. And it happens with all, all, De all DeFi and all crypto in general, that you start with something very, very simple, simple. And since it's all simple and it's based on modularity that comes from like the developed methodology that has been developed in the last 10 years, you end up having a very composable system that can grow with other systems growing as well. That can work in the sense like Aave, for example, has lots of systems built on top of it. Same for Uniswap V2 or same for Lens right now that has lots of smart contracts that are tapping into their base protocol and growing it. So as I said, it's very simple. You just need the right team. Nice. Love that. For sure. Uh, I love something, a part of what you said, which is like anything can be a DAO. I think that's a, that's a fascinating concept and it's true, right? As long as you're organizing to join, to do a, a common mission with a group of people, you'll need resources. You need to organize those resources. And essentially that's a DAO. Um, and I guess my question on that front is how could you be flexible while holding constraints and how could you adapt with immutable contracts, right? So uh, how are you guys thinking and playing with, with these kinds of um, concepts and, and limitations? That's, a, that's actually a great question. You have to think on the, all the different parts that users will have to interact with. When each one of them have different properties, if you're talking about the protocol, you, don't wa you want protocols to be robust. You don't want them to be changing every day. You don't want them to be annoying. When you're talking about the app layer or the user layer, you want that to be constantly growing, constantly evolving, adding new features, fixing bugs. So those different layers have different requirements on terms of upgradability and usability. So whenever you are designing them, you have to have that in your mindset. And even in the protocol level, you have different types. So for example, the vault or like what is the DAO contract, you are not going to upgrade that almost never. Like you don't really need to upgrade that. It's very simple. But when you go in the next layer, what is like the governance layer, for example, of the DAO, you might want to upgrade that from time to time. Like you don't change that every month. You maybe change that every three, no, well, three is even a little bit uh, too early, but maybe every five months, every 12, it depends on you that how it grows. So, and then when you go to the app layer, that changes almost every day. Or like, ideally, if you have the proper CI CD, you can deploy every single day, even a couple of times. So each one of the layers has different properties and you have to adapt to them. In case of like us, what we have is the base layer. As I mentioned, it's very robust. It's not supposed to be upgraded. It doesn't change the app that often. When you go for the plugins, we have the, the system, a system that allows them to be upgradable and has some kind of migrations, like so developers can understand what, what I mean. Uh, so you have certain rules to upgrade from version one to version 1.1 and different versions for upgrading to version 1.2, for example. And that has a different set of upgradability that is super important and has been added to the protocol that we have. And that's one of the key pieces, actually. Uh, it's kind of like a package manager and not many other protocols have something like this. And then the user layer, that's very simple. It's kind of like similar to Web2. You are great as much as you can. You want to provide the best usability for users. Cool, Carlos. So I hear you speaking about this kind of overarching architecture, right? We have this protocol layer. We have the app layer. I presume there's some kind of bridge through which they're speaking through each other. Um, so if you could take us a bit through this stack, uh, what's this stack of, of the Aragon current protocol? And let's speak a bit about potentially its architecture. Yeah, so when you think about protocols that are trying to be this uh, open, it's very fuzzy in a sense like in Web2, you own the whole stack. You decide on everything, all the pieces. When you are designing a protocol, 
it's not as simple because you don't know what the developers are going to build on top or what are they, what are they choosing. In our stack, the very base, uh, as, my, as I mentioned, it's written in Solidity. It has the base layer. It only has a couple of contracts that allow to, to be a vault to hold your treasury. And then you go into the plugins. Plugins need a setup. Well, we'll go into that later. And you can inherit that setup in any language that you want, as long as it compiles to EVM, of course. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, it, it, it needs to go to the blockchain. So you could use Viper, you could use Half, you could use uh, any of these languages, as long as you can import Solidity code into them, of course. But you could compile it, and like, yeah, you could do the bytecode thing and link the contract. So in that sense, the stack, you have the base layer with, that is more or less in, written in Solidity, doesn't need to be upgraded, it's there. Then the plugins level, we are writing them in Solidity because it's the language that we control and that we feel more safe. But actually, if any other user wants to build it and any other stack, we don't control that. It's out of our control. That's the good part. And we welcome everyone to build however they want or however they like or however they have more fun. And then about front end, the stack right now for that, we are, oh, let me get back to the core contracts. Because yeah, like, I always love talking about that. Uh, right now, we are using a hard hat. I know there is a lot of uh, buzz about Porsche. Mm -hmm. I love it for my personal projects. <laughs> Uh, but it, the protocol was started even before ports was a thing. So we haven't do the porting yet. And I, for, for our use case, this was not necessary. No, no, no. The hot take here is I love ports. It's actually my personal favorite. It's just like, doesn't make sense to change the whole infrastructure or the whole uh, base uh, yeah, course, DevOps layer framework. for this. And at the end of the day, solidity is solidity. It's the same in yeah. all these things. Yeah, all right. And so when we were speaking about this protocol, maybe let's chat a bit about uh, the contracts within it. You've spoken a bit, for example, about the DAO contract being a treasury. You've spoken about plugins. Um, what would you say are some of the, the key contracts there? Permission management. It's probably one of the parts that people normally often miss. Uh, so I want to talk about that one as well that we haven't really mentioned that much until now. But let me just start, start with one that we have actually mentioned, which is the Vault, which is the DAO, DAO contract. It doesn't do almost anything. You have to think about it as the most simple contract that exists out there. And that's a future. Simplicity is one of the biggest features that you can have in a smart contract. It just executes stuff, can transfer, and you can deposit into it. So it's essentially a, a treasury, a, a, a multi sig bank account, a Vault. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It doesn't do much, but that, that's the good thing. It doesn't have to do anything because if you force logic into it, then you will have that logic forever. Right. For example, if you think about multi-sig, if you start your DAO as a multi-sig, it means that you are always going to have to uh, fight against that functionality once you grow. If you have three users or three members of the DAO, that's fine. But once you have 20, it doesn't make sense to have a multi-sig there. And you're just like running code on top of it, but without no reason. And even more when you go into higher numbers of members of the community. So that's why you need a very lean uh, contract that holds the funds and doesn't do anything. And everything else is just programmable based on your needs. If you want to build a multi-sig into it, fine. You have the vault that doesn't do anything. And then a plugin that is just the multi-sig. So once you have that vault, and you have those logic that are able to execute anything on it, like governance plugins, you need to tie them somehow. You need to make, to turn a rope from one to, to, to the other. And that's where the permission management come in, comes in. You can set the permissions from different contracts to the vault. In the sense like you could say, this plugin only can only deposit funds. This contract can only withdraw funds. And this other contract can execute this under these rules. And that's the, where the permission management comes in. It allows for many cool things. For example, you could set a governance plugin that allows you to withdraw, I don't know, $100 without having much quorum in the voting or having three to four votes would be enough, for example, for $100. But once you go into higher numbers, you might need another governance mechanism that requires super strong 
uh, quorum and minimum participation because like someone could join your funds. So this permission management with oracles that check or like guardians that check those granular permissions can allow to have very programmable flows to your main contract. And that's actually one of the biggest features that we have. And I actually didn't know this until like a few months ago, but these permissions that you can grant are written in bytecode and you can actually add parameters into that bytecode in a way that you can actually set granularity without guardians. And when I was showing this in the documentation on Faragon, it was like mind blowing to me. It's actually very hard to use. I would never recommend this, but it allows you, it allows to do magical things with this permission management that I actually never thought about. And it was just a great decision made by our engineers. Nice, love to hear that. Um, so team, we've already gone through a lot. If there's any questions, comments, ideas that are popping up in your brain as Carlos is blowing us away with all this functionality, please feel free to uh, comment them in the little chat box over there. Um, would love to hear from, from some of you and, and what you're thinking and any questions that we may ask. Uh, but moving on, Carlos, because uh, there's a lot of what you said um, that is fascinating. I think specifically regarding the permission management system um, as a tool to keep immutable contracts flexible, right? I think that's that's a key kind of um, value proposition there that many within the industry have been struggling with, especially if we look at the value of, say, like a Web2 product, which is usually constantly iterating, constantly gathering feedback and, and being able to evolve. Um, and trying to keep a lot of that flexibility and adaptability within uh, DAO frameworks and, and organizations that will be evolving is key. Um, so we'd love to hear a bit from you as to like, why, um, how did it come about uh, this permission management? How do you envision it being used um, within organizations? What, what, what is the permission management able to do? I mean, it does so many things that it's actually super complicated to go into each one of them. So the very first thing that normally I, I think about is to allow other plugins or other smart contracts to tap into your vault. And whenever you don't want them to do that anymore, you just remove that permission. You don't have to deploy another contract. You don't have to upgrade the contract to disable it and then add another, another functionality as you have to do with many other frameworks. Like you don't have to do weird stuff. Yeah, for example, upgrading your contract just because you don't want it anymore and put it in blank just doesn't make sense. And many other protocols out there have to do that because they just think that they are going to need forever this specific feature. And contracts need to evolve. So one of the cool things that you have is you can have full immutability if that's what you want, if, if that's what you desire, and still manage those things through permissions instead of having to upgrade the contract with the security that sometimes uh, that brings. So as you're speaking about um, plugins and being able to change in the different permissions and not have to like upgrade or downgrade contracts as you go, which of course can be very complex, um, I think this is a great opportunity to speak more about these plugins. Um, and I think the best way whenever we're thinking of potentially these like con uh, abstract um, ideas within programming is to come with some examples. So what are some examples of plugins um, that come to you when, when we're thinking of plugins that we can build into a DAO framework? Yeah, so the easiest plugins that you can think of are governance plugins. These are the first thing that comes to your mind. You want a DAO to have some contributors that have to come up with certain decision, whether to take it or not. Um, so having a plugin that enables people to have a, like put up a proposal and then vote on it it's the very basic. And these governance plugins come in very, a lot of colors and shapes. You can have delegated governance as a one plugin. You can have on chain voting, normal ERC20s. You can have ENFTs uh, voting. And you can go even into more crazier stuff as the plugin that, or like the, the project that the CK Research from Aragon started that is aggregating the votes off chain and then generate a proof with zero knowledge and uploading that proof into a plugin and, and then counting the votes, well, counting the votes here and then proving that the votes were properly counted on chain. So you can do a lot of magic in these governance plugins. As I mentioned, like they can come from any 
any shape. You can integrate a snapshot into it if you want. You can integrate profiles uh, from Lens, and then these proposals can be posts on Lens. Like if you if you know a little bit of our Lens, those are like a post is a contract. So you could create a contract that is a post and a proposal at the same time, and then have kind of like social network uh, or DAO social network based on Lens. It's also pretty cool. And everything without leaving the governance types of plugins. But there are many more. For example, you could go for streaming, streaming payments. You could integrate Sablier or you could integrate Superfluid. And this, what it would enable is to provide continuous payments to your contributors, which is also pretty essential for many DAOs in the sense like it provides more feedback. It allows for having access to those funds with some uncertainties that things are going to go well from both ends. So also super needed for many DAOs. You can go also into a kind of abstraction and have your own personal DAO that it belongs to you and you share access between different uh, or your addresses, for example, a cold wallet and a hot wallet. And therefore you might need, if you, you for, for example, have to play, want to send a transaction for $100, you could do that with your hot wallet. But once you want to release transactions with, I don't know, $10,000, you might need a signature for you from your main wallet and the call wallet. So having a, DAO, a personal DAO, it also makes lots of sense as it's a tons of security. And nowadays, like security is one of the biggest topics that we need to think about after all that happened with FTX. You don't want to hold your tokens there. You don't want to hold your tokens in, a, in an exchange. If you can have property security methods, you could do this. And people talk often about cold storage, which is great. Everyone to have a ledger. But at the same time, if we can add even more security on top of it, it's always great. Nice, nice. Love to hear that. Yeah, I think that paints a good picture of kind of the extensibility of uh, the DAOs can have, especially as it correlates with either like how they're making decisions or how they're combining with other projects. Um, I'm very excited to, to see a lot of that compensability within the space. For sure. Um, and to potentially connect uh, this topic that we've been going on in terms of like plugins and permission management, um, how, how are those two related? I think that that's something that we've been kind of leaving out and that is a key part of, of this mm. proposal that you're making. It's actually very amazing how complex it can get once you like really got into it. So the permission management is not only like we were before describing is a way for connecting the plugins with the main DAO. And it's one of the greatest ways that you can do it. But the permission management goes way farther than that, way beyond. And you can have permission management from one plugin to another and then to the DAO. So let's say, for example, this is something that we are actually doing for our, for our own DAO. So like we are actually using all these tools. Uh, the permission management is the same. You could have the voting that you're going to use here. But then you want to add a period or let's say seven days where people can come in and think about the, the, the proposal. And then you have here the DAO. So what you do is you create a proposal through, the, through this delay or like this period. And once that period happens, it has permissions to create proposals in the voting app. And that voting app has permissions to execute on the DAO. So you could do these kind of like threads and chains of executions that allows to compose the plugins between themselves. So it goes way farther between just having a plugin and then a DAO. You have a chain of connections of plugins if you want, and connecting them, it's actually as easy as just having permissions. Super powerful. Uh, I love to, love to hear that and kind of uh, envision all the possibilities that could be done there. I just wanted to mention how it works, like more, or less, more, more into like the technical level. So like developers can take a picture of how really it works in, in code. Basically, this is a modifier. When you program the plugin, you set the permissions that it needs in bytecode. Like it's like adding like there the bytecode of the function. And whenever you want that permission to have it to, uh, to someone, you just call a function like, hey, set the, this permission to this address. Or set this address, this permission. That way, when you call it, it will call a modifier. Hey, this, per this address has this permission. Yeah. And then it will, it will execute that function. So this permission management doesn't go just to the whole contract. It can have as much granularity as you want for your plugin. 
Huge. Nice. Yeah. In many ways, it's like authorization, right? As we're used to thinking in like other ways of uh, software development practices, it seems like it's essentially an authorization modifier embedded within functions and within contracts themselves. Exactly. Nice. It comes everything from modularity. Sweet. And can anyone build plugins um, or who's currently building these uh, extensions for the, for the framework? So, I mean, anyone can build plugins, really. Uh, as long like we don't have permissions over it, we don't ask you to do anything. You don't have to pay us. You don't need to get an API. You don't need to give it your. You don't even need to give your email. You just. <laughs> it's very yeah. It's very annoying. Like all these web two applications need your email just to check the weather. Like why? So here, what you do is just you have to program two sections of a plugin. So you need to know how to program. That's it. That is true. So there, that's that. That's the big barrier. If you have that, it's fine. And in terms of like de developing it, it's actually pretty simple. And that was like one of the biggest concerns and things that we had in mind when developing this uh, protocol. And I'm sure Jordi next time will get into all the trenches on how it was like so hard building something that is super simple and the same time is super robust, but. Basically, you have the implementation of the logic, and then you have the plugin setup. The plugin setup knows about this implementation, and what it does, it's preparing the installation, the, update, the updating, and then installation of it. It also asks for the permissions, it handles the permission management, and all that stuff. And the implementation, even though there is one there that, you, that it's cloned, it's deployed per DAO. So each DAO has its own implementation that stores all the data to allow for migrations and storage, basically. At the end, it's actually just making a setup and then the plugin. And the setup is basically setting up the permissions and ensuring that the updates are fine. Nice. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I guess I love that you just mentioned specifically, like, oh, you need to learn how to program. Like, you need to know how to program in order to code plugins. Like, that makes sense. And so I'd love to take in a bit of, like, that segue into you know, bringing up the topic that, of course, most people within DAOs are not engineers. Um, and so I would love to uh, hear about the end user, right? So this is kind of, we've been speaking about the protocol layer, that's the base, but of course that will not be how people are usually interacting with um, with our framework. So maybe let's speak a bit more about that end user and, and how does that interface look like? Totally. So that's a very, very, a uh, good point. Not many people think about it when thinking about like developing plugins. And actually, it's very important. And it comes also down to the permission management system in the sense like, yeah, if you don't know how to program, it's going to be hard to do the code. But at the same time, the way that the system is designed based on permission management systems is that you can use them as Legos. So even if you don't know how to build something from the ground up, it's fine because you can just use pieces from different plugins plug them in with the permission management system, setting the proper roles for each one of them, and then everything ends up to the DAO. So you, even if you don't haven't coded anything, you still, through the different UIs, you can set up the plugin, like the permissions to each one of them until you have a very complex functionality that you might want. So even then can actually use all these pieces. Nice. I love that. Um, and so then Aragon is building such a app and interface. Uh, are they, are we simply expecting like other engineers to be building different interfaces? Uh, or how is it looking like uh, from the user experience of this protocol? We are actually building one interface with what we believe that right now it makes sense and does need. That doesn't mean that we cover 100% of the use cases. It just covers the one that we believe we want to work on. So we need help. Like this is not only on us. If we want DAOs to be a thing, if we want people to be able to work freely from whenever they want, however they want on the things they want, we need more interfaces and minds working on this very same problem. And that's the cool thing about this core protocol is that it allows anyone to build anything on top of it. Right now we are building our app, which is actually going pretty well lately. I think we be able to have soon, not saying that, uh, a beta for everyone to try it out. So what we have right now in our, in our mindset for this app is to do the most basic stuff, like the most basic core things that a DAO needs, but do them well. Finally do them well. And not just like, no, but it doesn't, it doesn't allow this or I'm having bugs. No, 
is just doing the right things well and not going into crazy ideas or moonshot things that nobody has tested out. We're going for the basics, but ensure those basics have the best user experience and is, are the most human-centric that all can be at this stage. Still, you need to know about crypto, but once you have done that step, this will make a lot of sense to you, what we are building. Nice. And I presume then, like, if uh, Aragon is building its own app and its own interface, as well as the protocol, um, could you speak a bit about, like, how these two are connecting to each other? Uh, are they are you also releasing an SDK? Are they simply tapping directly into the contracts? Uh, how is that looking? Oh my God, Juliet, how can you make these questions so good? Like, it's like, <laughs> it's like you knew everything. Yeah, so the SDK, you love the SDK. We all love the SDK, really. Um, this is the, we're building, yeah, we're building obviously an SDK that allows anyone to tap into this protocol without really know, having to know anything about smart contracts or the governance systems or even plugins. This SDK allows you to deploy DAOs. And since DAOs are nothing, are just like a vault, everything else, it's up to you. It's up to the plugins that are also in the SDK. So basically, it allows to, for you to create different types of hyperstructures that you can build like the Legos in pure JavaScript. Like you don't, it, it's literally like no more than, no more than 15, no, well, no more than 10 lines of code, maybe 15. But it's very, very simple. And I think, Juliet, you are building great tutorials and great documentation and great developer portals for anyone to tap into it. Hmm, nice. That's exciting. Yeah, it'll, it'll be exciting to see how people use it in some ways that potentially uh, the builders that built it itself haven't even envisioned. I think that's always the, the funnest part to see the different so, ideas come around from the same tools. We are eating our own uh, meals in the sense like we are... <laughs> We are building the SDK and the app is using it. So like the, our own front end purely uses the SDK. And this is something that we had in mind when designing the app in the sense like we want to provide these tools for other developers to build on top of it. And if we cannot use them or if they are not as useful for us as we want it to, it won't be useful for any for other developers either. So every, jo every logic when creating DAOs, voting, creating proposals, all that stuff is in the SDK. That includes graph, so graphs. That includes IPFS connections. That includes contract. If we need to go to the contract directly, includes the RPC connections. Includes everything. So you don't have to worry about anything at all. And that's important because, like, we wanted to we wanted to have that for our own UIs. So the very same tools that we use, exactly the same ones, everyone can access to. Juicy, love that. Um, all right, so we're coming to an end. We'd love to hear from uh, the team here. If you have any questions, comments, ideas, anything that sparked your brain as Carlos was describing all this in so much depth, uh, please feel free to chat them in. It would be lovely to get you in and, and have those answered. But I guess before we wrap up, Carlos, the question of the year, when will this be ready? Is it ready already? When can I start testing it out? Uh, what's the framework for the roadmap there? Um, is it ready? Um, I would say it's almost there, almost there. The contracts are already in, in Gorly, so I encourage everyone to go there, uh, see them, read through them, interact with them if they want to. Um, the documentation is getting there, right, Juliet? Yes, yes. Uh, and so, yeah, in Gurley, you can try them out. The SDK is working. Uh, so I encourage everyone to go there and try them out at developdevs.aragon.org. And in terms of the app, this week it was like pretty crazy. We've done amazing advancements this week, but it's not there yet. It's pretty close, but not there yet. We'll be trying it out internally uh, this week and testing it heavily. So you can expect news soon. Nice. Love to hear it. So the idea is that we're at, this is the first one. We wanted to bring Carlos in, who is our genius uh, tech lead, engineering, product development. 
human leading leading a lot of these efforts. So he's the first one we wanted to bring in to map out the whole architecture of uh, of the entire protocol and the product. But over the next few weeks, we'll be bringing our other engineers who have been deep into coding for the past few months, and we'll be touching upon each of these sections in a lot more depth. Um, so we'll be talking about plugins specifically, permission management, the app, the SDK, how everything is wrapping together. Um, so if you found this interesting, please hold up for the next ones. Uh, we'll be sure to bring in some more geeky fun. Um, okay, I see we have one question. Very nice. It says, how much of programming do you need to know to create plugins? What are some dream DAOs you would love to have built on this? As long as you know a bit of Solidity, you are pretty much good to go. You need to import from the base plugin, the plugin setup, and then add your custom logic. There are very good examples in our web website and also other community members that have already started with this. So you can actually copy and paste. I've done a couple of times already because like, I'm very lazy. I just go ahead, fork other plugins that are already there, erase the things that I don't like, which are most everything. And <laughs> you, end up, <laughs> you end up with like the classic 10 developer lines of way. Yeah, and you end up with like 10 lines of code that are actually the very basics for you to start doing your plugin. And the cool thing is actually if you have any other plugin or you've seen any other plugin that you, all, you know already and you want to turn it into a plugin, it's actually adding this couple, um, these few lines of code of the plugin setup, the permissions, setting up the permissions in the functions and not changing anything of the logic. So it's actually pretty easy to program them as long as you have some basic knowledge of Solidity. If you don't know Solidity, that's still somewhat fine in the sense like you cannot build your own plugin, but with the SDK, you can use them as you want and transform them in a way that is new and no one thought about. So it's just still okay. So could I build, say, like a custom DAO merely with the SDK, or do I need to know Solidity in order to do that? Definitely, you can, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use those plugins however you want, like make them, they are kind of like a puzzle where everything actually fits. It's kind of like that. It's a puzzle where the pieces don't have to be in a specific way. They can be in the way that you like and the picture will be exactly whatever you want. Um, you just, the connections are through the permission management. And at the end, you end up with this nice picture of the puzzle with that has all the connections that you wanted. So with the SDK, SDK you are completely fine. Nice, love to hear that. Um, for all our JavaScript developers out there who are certainly a lot more than the Solidity one. So that's great to hear. Um, all right, so we're coming to an end. Uh, if you found any of this interesting, we've been writing a lot of articles on the architecture and this whole DAO framework and how we're thinking about permission management and plugins. Um, so please feel free to go to our blog, aragon.org slash blog. There'll be a lot of content there. I'm turning it especially more and more technical as we're reaching a uh, lunch date. So for all you developers out there, um, if you have any questions, uh, anything that keeps coming up as potentially you go through the code base or, or spark some ideas, please feel free to reach out to me, be it on Twitter, be it on Discord. Uh, feel free to join in. We're having great uh, conversations on our dev chat channel, um, providing a lot of support for developers coming in and trying to build on top of us. So happy to have you involved in our community um, and excited to welcome in any of those crazy and fun ideas that you may be having. Um, thank you, Carlos, so much for your time and you. your ideas. It was great to hear uh, a lot of how, how this framework has come around. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Speak soon. See That's you in two up. weeks. <laughs>